Our message this morning comes from Acts chapter 28. Today we will wrap up your long series in the book of Luke and Acts. Some of you probably said hallelujah. Probably some of you maybe want to spend a little bit more time in the book of Acts. I'm so thankful to be here this morning. You know, crazy things happen when you preach at Faith Church. The first time I came here and spoke on Palm Sunday, I got to meet my Lacey, my fiance. So I'm so thankful for you guys and continue to appreciate your prayers for us. Can we take a moment and center our hearts um, in prayer this morning? Lord Jesus, we come with grateful hearts and we pray that our worship will be a blessing, a fragrant offering rising up before the throne of the Ancient of Days. We come and we, we come with grateful hearts, but yet we come with longing hearts, hearts that need a touch from Jesus. God, we come with praise and adoration, but also with confession and repentance because we are not worthy to be here. It was our sin that held you there, as we sang about earlier. And God, we thank you for standing in the place as the sacrificial lamb through your son. We ask you, Lord, to speak through your Holy Spirit. The, these words are just words on a page. If your spirit does not bring them to life in our hearts and in our minds, in our families, and in our communities. So we come with grateful hearts. We ask you, Lord, to speak. Your servants are indeed listening. Remove anything in our hearts and our minds that would separate us from you. Thank you for the atonement that you've made for our sin. We love you. We worship you. We praise your holy name. And God's people said, amen. amen. Acts chapter 28. We're not going to read the entire chapter. Hope you will go home this afternoon, spend some time reading Acts chapter 28. Begin reading with me in verse 17. Acts 28 verse 17. It's so good to see all of you here. If you're visiting with family, we are glad that you're here at Faith Church this morning. Acts chapter 28. Begin reading with me in verse 17. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. When they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you. Because of the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. They said to him, We neither receive letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you, verse 22. But we desire to hear from you what you think concerning this sect, for we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. When they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand and with their hearts and turn, so that I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching all things that concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. This is the word of the Lord. For the past 51 weeks, you have journeyed together through the books of Luke and Acts. You've learned a lot about Jesus. You've learned a lot about the church. And today we're going to wrap this journey up. As we've journeyed through Luke and Acts, the writer is inviting us to consider two 
questions that we need to think about how we will answer them ourselves this morning. The first question is this, how will you respond to Jesus? Will you respond like the religious leaders did in the first century and crucify him and walk away and reject his message and face his judgment? Or will you respond in faith and repentance? The second question that Luke invites us to consider this morning is this, how will we participate participate in the spread of the gospel. Did you know that God calls unlikely people to accomplish His purposes? If you and I were to pick out the team that we wanted to reach the world with the greatest story, the greatest news ever told, we would not have chosen ourselves. Maybe you would have, but I would not have chosen myself. (laughs) The title of the message this morning is Living on Mission. Last week, Pastor Daniel talked to you about peace and how that we can maintain peace even in the midst of great trouble and trials like shipwreck and persecution, we can have peace. And my word for you this morning is mission, mission. William Carey has been referred to as the father of modern Protestant missions. He lived from 1761 to 1834. He was raised in an obscure rural village in the heart of England. He was a shoemaker and he lived in poverty for much of his young life. Carey is known for many things, one of the most important, his commitment to overseas missions. He was at a meeting in the late 1700s where he was a newly ordained pastor, a newly ordained minister, and he stood up and he began to make a case for missions to which an older minister stood and replied, young man, sit down. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without consulting you or me. I hope none of us have the attitude toward missions, toward our community here in Chandler that this man had toward Carrie. Our God is a missionary God and he pursues relationships with unlikely people. We see that repeatedly both in the Hebrew Scriptures and in the New Testament. The reason Jesus came, Luke tells us, is to seek and save the lost. He came to bring us back from God. There was a great chasm and we couldn't cross the Grand Canyon by ourselves, but the cross is laid there so that we can get back to God. In Acts 28, we see both God's heart for all people as well as Paul's commitment to the Great Commission, to God's mission. But this was not a popular thing. Paul had been arrested. He had been taken away because of his preaching in Jesus and the resurrection. He had a shipwreck with the other prisoners. They landed on an island called Malta. And then eventually they get to Rome where he comes to preach the gospel. Now if you read the letter to the Romans, he says in there, Oh, how I long to come to you, but I was hindered. Eventually he did get to Rome apparently, and devoted two years of his life. And I will tell you this, the ending of Acts is strange. If we were writing Acts, we would want him to tell us what happened to Paul. But we don't know. And I think Luke is not so much trying to draw our attention to Paul as he is the spread of the gospel and this global grassroots movement called the church. And and the reason why the book of Acts ends on such a strange note is because God is calling you and me to live on mission for His glory. For His glory. The one take-home truth I want you to have this morning is this. We must intentionally live on mission for Jesus, just like Paul did. Living on mission means that we will prioritize our time, our energy, our money around following Jesus and building His kingdom rather than building our own. So before we understand how we need to live on mission, there's three truths that I'm going to share with you. This is how we can live out our missionary call. But before we do that, we need to immerse ourselves in this text. So many times we come to God's Word and we rush through and we we hurry through it and we think about what we're going to have for lunch this afternoon and celebrate birthdays or whatever we may be doing today. But I want to invite us just for a moment to focus on God's word to us. So these native people, we didn't read verse 3. In the Greek, it calls these people barbarians. We need to be careful when we read the Bible that we don't impose our understanding of words like that. It just means natives. 
Paul did not mean this in a pejorative sense at all. It was not meant to be slanderous. But these people demonstrated radical hospitality on these shipwrecked prisoners. It's weird. It doesn't make sense. But brothers and sisters, even though we didn't read verse 3, we cannot miss this important connection. Because the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem responded quite di differently to Paul. In fact, there was a group of 40 leaders who wanted to kill him. Just like they asked for John the Baptist's head, Herod asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter. These 40 leaders, go back and read like through chapter 23 of Acts, they wanted to kill Paul. He wasn't very popular. But at the end of the chapter, we read that these Jewish leaders reject Paul and his message. Brothers and sisters, the hospitality of these native islanders in Malta is insightful for us. We don't want to read too much into this text, but it's important for us to consider the role of hospitality and how that relates to the mission before we move on. Followers of Jesus are called to practice radically ordinary hospitality. As Rosaria Butterfield says in her book, radical ordinary hospitality gives us evidence of faith in Jesus' power to save. Christians, we sometimes let unbelievers do, uh, outdo us in showing hospitality, kindness, compassion, and grace. Let it not be said of us that our unbelieving family and friends are more hospitable than we are as the people of God. Brothers and sisters, God might use our radical, ordinary hospitality to impact someone in a way that leads them to trust Jesus. Not only were they treated with radical, ordinary hospitality, eventually they get on a ship, they make their way to Rome, and once he arrived in Rome, he requests a meeting with the Jewish leaders. He wants to talk about the hope of Israel. Now let's look at this uh, thing that he was bitten by a viper in verse 3 initially. I wanted to mention this earlier. Paul, Luke is using here a double meaning. Paul is bitten by a vi viper. Scholars have told us that there were no vipers present in the island. Well, why did the Bible say that? Did the Bible lie? No, because the Bible is true and trustworthy and all that it affirms. You can take it to the bank, build your life upon it. It's the only sure foundation for your life. The Bible doesn't lie. So why does Luke use the word viper? You guys remember this phrase that Jesus and John the Baptist used? You brood of vipers. Luke wants us to consider how we will answer the question, how we respond to Jesus. I think there's a double meaning here. Just like the viper latched onto Paul's hand and the religious leaders latched onto him and attacked him for the preaching of the gospel, so also this viper represents those who come against and reject King Jesus. But he was on trial for why? Why was Paul on trial? He was on trial, verse 20 says, for the hope of Israel. This phrase is important all throughout the books of Luke and Acts. All of Israel's hope, all of the Hebrew people's hope in the Old Testament was for the Messiah to come. And every group of the leaders, except for the Sadducees, believed in the doctrine of the resurrection. So Paul is saying, you have arrested me because I'm preaching in Jesus the resurrection, which you all believe in the resurrection unless you're Sadducees. When I was younger, I remember they told us the difference in Pharisees and Sadducees because the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. But the Pharisees did. It's very important Old Testament teaching. David believed in resurrection. He believed he would see his son again. Now, not only was Paul preaching on, on the hope of Israel, so, so the details we need to focus in on, he, he was bitten by a viper, he's preaching about the hope of Israel, and then number three, this is the focus of his life, his sole mission, his sole priority was the kingdom of God, verse 23. He says this, When they had appointed him a day, many came to his lodging, whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, is the New Testament make-believe, fairy tale, and a new thing. The New Testament believers saw themselves in continuity with the Old Testament scriptures, and they said, from the law of Moses and the prophets. The Old Testament testifies about Messiah. The New Testament tells us Messiah has come. We put them together, and there's a beautiful harmony, and we don't fully understand it, but it's beautiful. 
our Emmanuel has come. And not only has he come, but he has invited us to be participants in his kingdom. That was the focus of Paul's preaching. This phrase, kingdom of God in the church, we could talk about it, but do we really understand what it means? The New King James Version actually mentions kingdom of God 142 times in 39 verses in Luke and Acts alone. I think Luke's trying to tell us something. We need to focus on the kingdom. The kingdom matters because we all long for purpose. We all long for a greater story to which we can belong. The deep longing for purpose and fulfillment is deep within the human heart. And we cannot recognize our purpose until we see how our little story connects to God's big story of creation, fall, and redemption. It's all about the kingdom. The kingdom of God impacts all of life. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But I want to ask you this question. What are you centering your life on? If you're a disciple of Jesus, your life must center on Jesus and His kingdom. Just as the theme of Paul's preaching and teaching was God's kingdom, we must allow the kingdom of Jesus to become our driving force. When we build our lives on Jesus and the kingdom, we're building our house on the rock. When we build our lives, church, on the passing things of this world, we are building on sand, which results in devastation emptiness, and ultimately death. But in this passage, there are three, past, three truths about discipleship, three truths that help us live out our mission. Let's, let's bring Acts 28 down to the real world for normal people just like you and me, desperate to hear from God. Three truths for living on mission as a disciple. Number one, disciples demonstrate hope even in suffering. Verse 20, I am bound because of the hope of Israel. Paul claimed that he was arrested for this reason, and we learn that this was a very important phrase. But we learn of Paul's view of suffering in his other writings in the New Testament. One of the most powerful reflections from Paul in relation to suffering is in Philippians. He was arrested, and more than seven times in the book of Philippians, he says joy or rejoice. But that is not the attitude that you and I often have when we face hardship, discouragement, depression, anxiety, fear, failure, pain frustration. When we go through those things, what do we feel? We get mad at God and we shake our fist at Him, but Paul counts it a joy. So disciples of Jesus demonstrate hope even in suffering. Peter tells us this, when you go through trials, you need to remember that just as Christ the Messiah suffered, you also will suffer. And James tells us that the, the, the trials actually produce joy in us if we can understand that paradox. God's people demonstrate radical hope even in suffering because we do not rely on our feelings but on God's proven faithfulness. How many of us would recognize an opportunity to proclaim the gospel if we were arrested? We would probably be yelling, I want my attorney. I want to speak with someone. Are you videoing this for Instagram and Facebook Live? We would draw a scene to everything except how the gospel can work in brokenness. As we think about what it means to live on mission, we need to change the way we think about suffering. You can't do that on your own. I can't do that on my own. We can't wake up one day and say, hey, I want to have the same attitude of suffering that Paul had. You've got to let the Holy Spirit transform you through the Word. Not only do disciples demonstrate hope and suffering, notice with me the second truth. Disciples possess revolutionary commitment to the mission. Not the things of this world, but to the mission. Verse 22, we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. There was a time in America where Christianity was cool and popular, and you could be a member of the big church in town and get elected into office. Those days are no more. And I think there is a sense in which we should grieve the state of our nation, the state of our community, the state of our political leaders in either party. But at the same time, we run at the first hint of negative news. But yet we see Paul and the early Christians holding fast, even though they were spoken against everywhere. By the way, this phrase occurs all throughout Luke and Acts. 
It wasn't politically convenient. It wasn't cool to follow Jesus because the thing is, Jesus calls us to come and die. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Are you committed to his mission or building your own kingdom today? Brothers and sisters, Acts 1.8 is the mission brief for the church. Our soldiers, when they go out, our soldiers, police officers, sheriff department, there's a mission brief. If there's a natural disaster, the first thing that's going to happen is there's going to be a command center that is established. Brothers and sisters at Faith Church, we are not making up our own mission brief. Pastor Daniel, Pastor Eric are not making up their own mission brief. They're following Acts 1-8 to go and share the gospel to Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. They're following Matthew 28 to be disciples who make disciples. I know that Pastor Daniel and Pastor Eric have had this one goal in mind, to equip you to be ambassadors for Jesus. Ambassadors do not go to another country and speak whatever they want to speak, but ambassadors go and say the thing that the king or the royal official tells them to say on behalf of the greater good. The sad reality is that in churches in America, we're not making much of a difference at all in the lives of our communities and in our churches, because why? We're not really committed to Jesus or the church. It's convenient. We can go there on Sunday morning and spend 45 minutes. But if you want me to get engaged in small group or leading prayer or personal Bible reading and discipleship, I am out because I am not committed. And by the way, if we want to really impact our culture for Christ, it's not in screaming all the things that we're against. And there are some things biblically we should be against. And there is a time and a place for God's people to take a stand in love. But... We need to listen to what Paul said to Timothy. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will teach others also. So much discipleship here. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 2 Timothy 1, 2, 1 through 4. Why is the church in America not making an impact on our cities and communities today? It's because of us. It's because we are not committed. It's because we are entangled with the affairs of this life. It's because we are more concerned about whether or not we should stream our service or whether or not we should have one service or two service. We are so concerned with all these things. Meanwhile, people around us are hurting and starving for hope and just a little bit of love. And the sad reality is, if we were truly committed to the mission of Jesus, our churches would be full because why? People feel the love of the Savior. I know this is hard. And as I read and as I studied this week, the Holy Spirit began to say to me, how is your commitment, Dustin? Because you're either going to be lukewarm or you're going to be on fire or you're going to be cold. But how is your commitment, church? And what I want to challenge you to do as you go into a new year is renew. Maybe in your heart, maybe some of you at the end of service need to come to the altar and pray and say, I give you myself. Lord, I consecrate faith, church. I consecrate my family. Daddies, you need to consecrate your children and your wife to the Lord and be committed no matter what happens, no matter what discouragement you face. I will commit to the mission of making disciples who make disciples Why? Because it's through broken vessels that God's glory pours out and impacts and changes people. May He give us greater commitment than we have. There's a third truth in this passage I want us to think about. And it's connected to the second one. Disciples of Jesus prioritize the kingdom of God above all else. The disciples' first priority must always be Jesus and the kingdom. Paul was passionately committed to Jesus from the time of his conversion in Acts 9 until the end of his life. His commitment was unwavering, even though many times it would have been easy to give up. Paul counted everything as a lost church. Philippians 3, the word loss is like garbage dump, putting it nicely. What is the thing in your life that is a priority? 
If you spend your time, energy, or money on anything other than being Jesus' disciple and building His kingdom, could it be that you've lost the focus of what really matters? He's inviting you today to trust Him, to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and to realize that He is our true north. Brothers and sisters, the kingdom of God is our first priority. Abraham Kuyper, listen to this. Abraham Kuyper said this. There is not one square inch under the whole creation of which King Jesus does not loudly proclaim mine. And guess what that means? Even those places in your heart that you don't want to talk about, that you don't want to bring up, that you hope stays hidden and nobody ever talks about, Jesus goes to that place and He says, Mine. We pray the prayer, build your kingdom here, but so often our hearts are far from that. We want Him to build His kingdom out there, but we don't want Him to build His kingdom here because that means we may have to change and walk in faith. These three commitments as disciples, we need to demonstrate hope, we need to have revolutionary commitment to Jesus, and we need to prioritize the kingdom. Very simple, but we need to go back to the basics sometimes. Brothers and sisters, we must intentionally live on mission for Jesus, just like Paul did. Living on mission means that we will prioritize our time and money around following Jesus and building His kingdom rather than our own. Again, William Carey said this, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. As you and I seek to become more missionally minded people, we must trust in the goodness and sovereignty of God. We must seek ways to impact our family, friends, and community with the life-changing good news of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit has already given you everything you need to live on mission. Faith Church. He's already given you what you need to build the church your friends and neighbors will join and that your children will lead. God has already given you everything you need to follow Jesus, grow in a group, or serve on a team. And my prayer for you is that you will all live on mission, be renewed in the power of the Holy Spirit, and that you will wait with eager expectation the arrival of the Prince of Peace who will come and eradicate death and destruction once and for all. Will you pray with me as Don comes this morning?